Is that me? Psalms 100. I went to the uh, men's conference. If you hadn't been with 1,100 men or so, I hear them sing and shout. It says, shout to, for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come for him, come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his, and we are his people, his sheep, and he is in his pasture. I'm going to thank you all for being here this morning. I'm thankful that people choose to come to church, choose to worship God, being like minded being around a thousand men or so that were like minded worship, worshiping God together was awesome. When uh, the guys that went, you have to admit, when le- however many men it was, 1,100, 900, when they all start singing, the hair on the back of your neck stands up. They raise it in their hands and singing to the Lord, for the Lord, for He is our Lord. So let's be mindful of those who aren't here. Let's, let's call them. Let's make sure that, we, that they knew they were missed. And uh, I see our girls back, Michelle. Bonnet woman, two knees now. Remember Jay as he preaches. Remember as we sing. Remember those who are, have had surgery, Jolie. Remember Jolie. Uh, Wendy Maccabee. I don't know what's going on with Wendy. Just remember Donnie. And just remember the lost, those who don't know Christ. You know, when, when each of us in this room who are saved, got saved, we were given a job. It was to tell other people about him. That's our job. If we aren't doing it, then we're not doing God's will. So there's opportunities that I won't have that somebody else will to witness to somebody and tell them about Jesus. That's the most important thing we can do is lead somebody to Jesus. Matter of fact, when you get to do that, that is about as close as you're going to get to God walking on this earth when you get that chance to lead somebody to Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this day. Oh, Lord, I'm thankful for a, a building that you've provided for us so we can come together. Lord, we can come together and worship the one and only Jesus Christ. One who come and who came and died for our sins, and without that, Lord, we we have nothing. Lord, I pray for this service. I pray, Lord, you bless it, and Lord, it will glorify your name. And Lord, I want to thank you for what you've done, and I'm thanking you, Lord, now for what you're going to do in the future. Lord, we love you and thank you for this day. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.
pit of my despair. There you were in the shadows, holding out your hand. You met me there, and now. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. 
him holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me jesus the name above every other name jesus the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will beside you open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your love and lead me into those who rose around me thank you you may be seated you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus chapter 20. But if you see all those tabs in my Bible, we're not staying there. But Exodus chapter 20 will be our launching pad. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you are here. We're going through the Ten Commandments and we're looking at a picture of the heart because ultimately that's what the Ten Commandments do is they reveal what our true hearts look like. And so far what we found out is we're missing on all of them. Last week I heard some comments about murder that people had not really thought about before. I can promise you that when you get to this uh, horizontal relationship with our fellow man that it doesn't get any easier from honoring your parents on to the end. And so thank you for being here today. Uh, I was just encouraged yesterday, I'm just uh, repeating what Rick said of the, the, the men's conference that we went to, challenged as a pastor, challenged as a man, and I know that those who were there all received the same things. 
All I can do is just tell you to buckle up your pew belts because I'm ready to preach now because I've been challenged by those other, other pastors. But today we're going to be looking at keeping your vows. Just as a disclaimer, our topic today is sensitive. When you address the sanctity of marriage and the, the God-intended design for intimacy, it creates awkward moments especially for parents of younger children. And so as your pastor, I'm giving you a, a heads up in case questions surface this afternoon. And in that, in that regard, if they do surface, call Pastor Josh. He is ready to answer all of your questions. He's prepared to answer anything that you would bring to him. I'm just, I'm just kidding with you. By the way, parents, you, you cannot slip away to children's church with your children either to avoid this topic. In fact, nothing that we talk about today is going to shock or embarrass God. He doesn't, he doesn't have a problem with any of it because, well, it was His idea. Five words in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. You say, well... Let's close it up. Let's go home. We're good with this. We know exactly what you're saying. In Mark chapter 8, verse 38, Jesus described the time in which he was on earth as a wicked and adulterous generation. Jesus said that about his generation. Wow. If that was true then, what could we accurately call our generation today? So I'm afraid that historians looking back on our present culture would conclude that we are numbly obsessed by wickedness and all forms of sexual immorality. Consider how many lives have been devastated by the breaking of this commandment. I'm sure that each of us knows one, if not more, who has fallen into this sin. Given the very permissive views towards sex today, one statistic predicted, and this is America-wide and I think it's low, 50% of all married men have had an extramarital affair. And 41% of married women have been unfaithful. Even among Christians, there was a poll of 1,000 subscribers to the generally Christian magazine, Christianity Today. They did a random sampling of 1,000 subscribers, and they asked them if they had ever committed adultery or acted inappropriately. 45% said that they had acted inappropriately. 23% confessed to committing adultery. The sin of adultery is painful. It wrecks homes, it destroys lives, it harms children, and it ruins reputations. This command is not just for those who are married. It is also for those who are single, for those who are divorced, for those who are widowed, for those who are a widower. It is for our teenagers as well as our senior adults. Even among pastors, I've never heard one, ever, say, I'm glad this happened. I've never known a, a Christian so broken over their sin who didn't with one ounce of their being wish that it hadn't occurred. So I would present to you that there may not be a point in contemporary morality that is more in conflict with God's law than in the standard that we find in the seventh commandment. Why? Why? Because by inference, this commandment is establishing the value of marital faithfulness which was established by God. And that is one man and one woman in a covenantal commitment for life. Adultery is the act of physical unfaithfulness that undermines that commitment. But just remember, these commandments are really a picture of our hearts. And Jesus made it clear that adultery is really the fruit of a deeper root. 
So if we focus only on the physical act itself, we will miss the intent of this commandment. But even with a sensitive topic, I want to offer you great hope for help and healing today. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for your inerrant, inspired, infallible word. We thank you for the truth found in your word. God, we know that these commandments are tough. We know that they're hard to, to look at from a, from a law standpoint, from a personal standpoint. We know that we don't measure up. And so, God, we're not here to beat, us, beat ourselves up, but to rest in your grace, to rest in your mercy, to thank you for your forgiveness and your salvation that you gave us through the cross. Lord, no doubt there's someone here today listening to me, either in person or online, that has been affected by this greatly. We know that. And so, God, we're not covering that up. We pray that we would just be open with you, that we would be transparent with you, because we know that you see our hearts anyway. So, Father, would you move anything out of the way that would, be, uh, that would take away from what you want to accomplish in our lives today? Take away any distractions, take away any mindsets, any preconceived opinions that we may have, God, that will keep us from hearing from you. Because we know that ultimately your word wants to provide healing and forgiveness. So don't let us leave here the same way we're in. God, I pray that you would move me out of the way, that the words that are spoken would not come from me. God, I don't want to be seen. My name means nothing. Father, I want you to be seen. And I want your, you to receive the glory that you are due. And Lord, help us to respond to the Holy Spirit as he leads. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to share with you four things this morning concerning this commandment. And the first thing, we're just going to dive right into it, is the reason for this command. And you see all the scripture that we're going to be diving into. But there is a reason for this command, just like with all the commandments. Let me just remind you that the Ten Commandments are divided into two sections. We've talked about that. The first four are relating to our, our vertical relationship with God. And then the last six relate to our horizontal relationship with fellow man. The fifth commandment that we looked at a couple of weeks ago was to honor your parents. It is life Giving. That is where you receive life from your parents. And so God says, honor your parents. Last week we looked at murder. The sixth commandment says, do not murder. It is life protecting. So you've got life giving, life protecting. And then what we're looking at today will be considered life living. Placement matters. Placement matters. The, the order that God delivered is not a coincidence to us. So what is adultery? I think we all know what the general definition is, but we're going to throw one out there anyway. It is where any married person engages in any type of inappropriate or sexual relationship with someone other than their spouse. But please hear me. The sin of adultery actually covers many sexual sins that occur in our lives, which then leads to the heart behind it all. If you remember, Jesus did this exact thing when he was questioned by the Pharisees or anyone else. He always went back to the heart. He always went back to the root. And so he always referred back to God's picture. Because even though sin invaded every area of human life, including our sexual lives, it did not corrupt God's expectation. So, we're going to go back to the beginning. Because that's where it starts. I want you to see Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 through 24. I'm going to talk a little bit between these verses. We're not going to read them all through entirely. Verse 20 says, The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Every modern debate that's in our society today, 
that is filled with false ideologies is settled for us in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. We see first thing that there is a God and that He made us. He made us male and He made us female, period. Then He performed the first marriage between one man and one woman. And so in reality, there is no basis for any confusion today. But when there is confusion about the covenant of marriage, there will be confusion around the covenant of salvation. You can mark it down. It's all very theological. If you try to put circles around who makes up the marriage covenant, then you will start putting circles around God's right for redemption and forgiveness. I want you to notice verse 23. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. I, I, I smile every time I see this, because my mind goes in different directions. But can you just imagine Adam taking him a nap, and then waking up to find the woman? That's exactly what takes place. Adam, Adam wakes up from his, from his, his, his sl uh, slumber and he says, Whoa, man! That's not far from the Hebrew, by the way. That's just the best, the, the best rendering that we can get there. I, I've been looking at aardvarks and hippos all day long. God, this is what I'm talking about. Thank you! And so Adam understands that. Now notice verse 24. Here comes the marriage. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. See, this is a reminder to parents. They don't, they don't stop being your children. But they become one flesh with each other, not with the parents. When God joins them as one flesh, this is referring to His design for intercourse. And sexual intimacy is a gift to the husband and to the wife. It is to provide procreation, to provide pleasure and intimacy. But the number one reason that God gifted and gave the idea of sex is to strengthen a marriage relationship. That is the number one reason. And so sexual intimacy is only for the covenant relationship of marriage. This is precisely why God only views heterosexual marriage as legitimate. Now I know that many would say, ah, yeah, that's Old Testament. No, it permeates Scripture. It's all throughout Scripture. As a matter of fact, let me show you in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, Jesus says this. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become, what? One flesh. Verse 6, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This is Jesus speaking here. And so he is quoting Genesis because, well, he wrote it through the power of the Holy Spirit, which proves that the original standard doesn't change. Now, let's fast forward to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 31. Paul is speaking to wives and husbands, and in verse 31, he says the same thing. Therefore, a man shall leave his father's mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So God's design for marriage is consistent throughout Scripture but also his prohibition for sexual immorality. I want you to see Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So as we saw last week, this is, this is Jesus raising the bar from the control of your body to the purity of the heart behind it. 
We're going to look at this a little bit more in just a few minutes. But I want to show you one more verse in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. The author says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Listen, even though sin has polluted creation, the designer's expectation and holiness has not changed. This is God's will. But I also understand that this isn't the reality in many of our lives. It is God's will that you are born, that you grow up, that you express yourself fully and sexually to your spouse inside of your marriage and to no one else until death separates you. So there is a reason that God gave this command. But secondly, I want you to see the harm of breaking this command, the dangers that come when we break this commandment. You know, one of the things that you can do when you hear a message like this is to defer. A preacher Jay, you know that I'm still single, so I've not yet committed adultery. Or I'm, I'm married, but I've never struggled with the temptation of adultery. Or I've been married for 30, 40, or 50 years, and those types of struggles have long since passed me. Let me tell you something. You may be strong, but you're not stronger than Satan. When you stick your chest out and you say, that doesn't apply to me, I've never done that, you've just offered him a free shot. You're asking for a free shot. Can I remind you of what Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 28? But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her, where? In his, heart. In his heart. This is important. In other words, mentally going through the act with someone other than your spouse. But please hear me. Jesus is not saying there's no difference. There's absolutely a difference between sins of the mind and sins of commission. I can assure you that every wife in this room, while not excited about it, would much rather deal with a husband who struggled with a lustful thought versus one who actually committed physical adultery. The hard truth is that the, the consequences of our sin differ based on the degree to which we give in to the sin. So for sure, the, the consequences of dealing with a lustful thought are, are far different than the actual act. But Jesus is saying that while you're dealing with worldly issues, this is the true heavenly standard. This is the way God sees it. I want what goes on, I want your mind and your thoughts to be pure and free. That's what Jesus is telling us in this verse. And so if you, if you manage what goes on between your ears well, then you won't have to worry about where your body may go. Listen, I'm not making any excuses. But every man in this room knows full well the battle of lust because of how we are wired by God but also how sin has taken advantage of that. See, the way to deal with it is to be proactive and not act like it's never present or it won't happen to you. God desires for us to take control of the battle of our minds, which, by the way, is the name of our Bible study for the men. And you can still be involved in that if you want to on Wednesday night with us. Don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Don't let him in your mind to corrupt what's going on. But what happens when we don't? What happens when we, when we look away and we don't pay attention to these signs? Well, thankfully, because the law has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, we no longer act on the law the way the Old Testament Jews did. But you know what the law said in Leviticus chapter 20, right? 
Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. I know what you're saying. Oh no, here we go back to Leviticus. Let me show you, if a man commits adultery with, his wife, of his, with the wife of his neighbor, and that doesn't just mean his next door neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So why don't we do that now? That would eliminate a lot of it. Because I have a Savior who died for every adulterer. We don't execute people because of their violation of God's Word because God allowed His Son to be executed for the lawbreakers of all His Word. And we have to remember that. Yet you cannot read a passage like this without grasping how serious God is about this topic. You hear what it says in Leviticus 20 and just think about what he said in Exodus 20 verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. Don't do it! So we see that application, but even on this side of the cross, the command is still on us. The command is still very real to us. Let me show you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 Paul is speaking about a life that is pleasing to God. And he's telling the church there in Thessalonica in verse 3, For this is the will of God. You want to know what the will of God is? Here it is. Your sanctification. That you abstain from sexual immorality. The Greek word there is pornea. Of course, that's where we get our English word for pornography. I don't have to tell you this, but the statistics are staggering as to how addiction to pornography has ravaged our society. Out of 68 million search inquiries, one out of four are related to pornography. Just found this out yesterday. 94% of children will have seen pornography by age 13. But let me tell you what my concern is. The church. My concern is with the church. And here's why. In statistics from Lifeway in 2022, I'm sure this has probably changed. 70% of church-going men regularly view pornography. 70%. In fact, the most recent studies suggest, and I hope, I hope these are just somebody just reaching. It's one out of two. 50% sitting in the pews of the church are looking at pornography. Truth is, it could be higher. It could be higher. No wonder the church is viewed as irrelevant by our culture today. We haven't separated ourselves. We're not sanctified. We're not set apart. We're just like them. But in this text, Paul is referring to any type of sexual deviation other than one man and one woman inside the covenantal relationship of marriage, which, by the way, absolutely puts pornography in the context of Matthew 5, 28. I know that's countercultural today, but listen, don't forget that our opinion of what we think is kosher does not change God's. You say, well, what if we really love each other? What if we truly love each other? Pornia. Jay, what if, what if we're engaged? Pornia. You may have signed the contract on the house, but you haven't closed on it yet. And I know what some would say, because it's not mentioned precisely right there. What about homosexuality? Jesus doesn't even mention that. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. 
11 times in the New Testament, he affirms the Old Testament standard of blessed sexual intimacy. By the way, he's God. Don't forget that he doesn't change the standard. He actually raised the bar on the standard. So he absolutely says that. And what Jesus says is it's one man and one woman in marriage. Hey, don't shoot the messenger. Take it up with the message. I'm not telling you something that God's Word doesn't say. Any sexual deviation outside God, God's holy standard is pornea. It is sexual immorality. Doesn't matter. You can call it what you want to. It doesn't change it. Any of it. Now let me show you what he goes on to say in verses 4 and 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Watch this. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Those words by Paul right there are interesting. Who do not know God. I just told you last week, and I've told you before, and I'm going to continue to repeat this, that it does not shock me when lost people act lost. That's what they do. But it is very shocking for a person to call themselves a Christian and blend in with the lost world. And that's what we've done as a church. That's what we've done as a people. We just blend in. We just chameleonize, if that's even a word. We chameleonize ourselves with them. We're just one of them. So we're not criticized. And Paul is saying that what should set our sexual ethics apart is not just about morality. It's our spirituality. It's what we have through Jesus Christ. We should be different. Can I just give you my PSA? I'm going to do it anyway. It cannot be undone. If you break this commandment, it cannot be undone. I didn't say it can be forgiven. I did not say that. I said it cannot be undone. If you are here this morning and you have never committed adultery, but you are married and your marriage is in trouble and you are struggling, you know that the door of opportunity to act in an inappropriate way is there. Brother, sister, do not do it. It will destroy your life. Amen. I'm reminded of David. He was a man after God's own heart. That's what the Bible tells us. He was a man after God's own heart. And think about how far he fell. I've never spoken with a man who committed adultery who said, You know what? I always thought I would. No. What do they say? Never thought I'd be telling you this. I never thought I would be in this position saying this to you. Folks, it is so crucial that you maintain a sober, sincere fear of the consequences and the harm of violating this commandment. So there's a reason for this command. There's a harm. There's a danger in breaking this command. But I want to give you some help and I want to give you some healing because that's what I want to focus on most today. Let's talk about some help for avoiding adultery. Let's put up some safeguards. Let's put some, some practical safeguards in place to help keep this from happening. You see, every individual in this room has to think about how you're going to guard your life from sexual sins, specifically adultery because that's what we're talking about today. I'm going to give you two words. You can remember two words. It's not a sentence, it's two words. Chase, flee. Chase, flee. Now they're two different words, right? They mean two different things. Right? Okay, some of you are not sure about that. You think it's a trick question from the pastor every time. I promise you it's not a trick question. Do you remember tackle the man with the ball? Anybody ever get caught up playing that in school? I don't know what it was around here, but where I grew up, it was destroy the man with the ball. It wasn't just tackle the man with the ball. And so because of this, it was a lot more fun for me to chase people instead of fleeing from people. So what is, how does this apply to us? Let's think about the word chase. What should we be chasing? 
proactively pursue Jesus. Chase after Jesus. Men, because I've been around 900 men for the last, for over this weekend, chase your wife. Chase your children and their hearts. Chase serving in the church. Chase lost people. That's what you go after. That's what you pursue. You don't have to have a lot of energy or money to do these things. I can promise you, if you spend your energy and your money chasing your Savior, your wife, your children, your lost friends, your neighbors, the mission and vision of the church, you won't have time to chase another woman. And this is why David got into trouble. This is precisely why. He didn't go off in the war as was his job as the king. So often when, when people deal with sexual sin, they think of everything that you're not supposed to do. I'm telling you what to do. Live your life to the fullest about the things of God. But here's the deal. That doesn't make you immune. If you do all those things, if you check that list, that doesn't make you immune. But it does lower the probability and the opportunity. So that's chasing. What about the fleeing? Growing up, we would say, get out of Dodge. Get out of Dodge. Run. Well, what do we need to flee from? Well, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, Paul reminds us to flee from any hint of sexual immorality. Even the thought of it, even the hint of it. Do you know why Paul said this? Because I can't stand near sexual immorality and not be drawn to it. We're not nearly as strong as what others may think. And sex is extraordinarily powerful. So run from it. Flee it. Paul says that every other sin a person commits outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Here's a fact. There is no such thing as casual sex. You cannot separate your body from your soul and your mind. In fact, that's how God designed it. That's why sex is so powerful. When you, when you give yourself to someone physically, you're giving yourself to someone physically from a place of commitment emotionally. Our culture, and I don't have to tell you this, but our culture is obsessed with searching for love. It's everywhere. And that desire is fueled by Hollywood and romance novels. But as long as the world reduces sex to just a physical act of pleasure, they will never find it. That's not what God gifted it for. And so Paul says, don't just get away. Get away from any form of sexual immorality, even the hint of it, which would include what he mentioned in Ephesians 5, 4, all filthiness and foolish talk or crude joking. Hello. Those inappropriate conversations with coworkers of the opposite sex. By the way, if you complain about your spouse or someone of the opposite sex all the time, expect your enemy to exploit your dissatisfaction. Let me throw some safeguards out at you. This is common sense stuff. Avoid those sympathetic touches or extended hugs. Don't do that. Men and ladies, no secret social media accounts. Make all your passwords available to your spouse. Don't hide anything. Avoid being in the same room or riding in the same vehicle with the opposite sex alone. I can assure you, I can tell you from a pastoral standpoint, if you call me and want to come and talk to me and you're a female, my door is going to be open. It's not going to be a closed meeting. As a matter of fact, my secretary knows that she's going to keep her door open as well. And I usually call my wife and say, I'm having this meeting. So it's just, it's just good practice. Don't put yourself in that position. Even if it's innocent, don't put yourself in that position. Avoid the, the social meetings or even meals, even if they're business essential. 
Avoid being with someone of the opposite sex like that. Avoid the extended text with any kind of emotional content in the text and talk to them in person. Don't, don't do it through text. But here's the thing. Even when you try to do what's right, Satan is still at work. He's still working. You say, well, Jay, how do you know that? Think about Joseph in Genesis chapter 39. Potiphar's wife chased after Joseph. Scripture makes it clear that he was good to look at for her. But he equated adultery as a sin, not only against his own body and a sin against Potiphar, but it was a sin against God. But Mrs. Potiphar became insistent. Day after day, she would chase after Joseph, and he would not give in. Of course, the one day that he went into the house to work, and no one was around, Ding, 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 ding. We've got a, a safeguard here. There's a key. She grabbed his garment. He was a strong guy, and so he left his garment there. He broke it. He tore it, however whatever it looked like, and he fled. Let me ask you, did Joseph run because he was strong? Did he run because he was strong? No. He did it because he knew if he stayed, he would sin against God and everything that he believed in. Let me give you a, an equation. Healthy safeguards plus healthy relationships equals a holy life. If you can put this into practice, you can put safeguards around committing adultery. Healthy safeguards and healthy relationships equals holy life. Men or women, you need safeguards and you need accountability partners who will speak truth and love to protect you against marital unfaithfulness. Amen. You need those people who will talk to you. But then finally, and we're going to hurry, let me give you some healing for the pain of adultery. We want to talk about that. Because some of you have committed adultery. Others have been impacted by it. But I don't want to focus on either one of those things. I don't want our focus to be that. I want our focus to be on Jesus. Because you see, in John chapter 8, Jesus had an adulterous woman brought before him. And the text is very clear that they didn't bring the man, probably because it was a, a set-up trap for Jesus from the start. And more than likely, they had no intention of real justice. They said, all right, Jesus, this piece of trash has been caught in the act. And there she stood, as Scripture indicates, half naked and fully embarrassed. The law says that we should stone her. We know what the law says, right? We just read that. The law says that we should stone her, but we will know what you say about this. Jesus knew that was a trap. He knew that he didn't have a yes or no answer. Either way, it was going to cause problems. And so verse 6 says that Jesus bent down and started writing in the dirt. We have no idea what he wrote. There's many theories about what he wrote. But you want me to tell you what we know? He rode in the dirt. That's what we know. But then he stands up and he said, and I, and I, imagine, I, I imagine all, all this stuff is playing out. But Jesus stands up and he says, all right, any of you who don't have sin in your life, any of you without sin, fling away. And John tells us that from the oldest to the youngest, because the older you are, the more aware you are of your sin. They started dropping their stones. And they walked away. Can you imagine the sound that she heard? Of the, 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 I don't know how many was there, but she heard, it had to echo loudly in her mind. The only one left was Jesus and the woman. And I imagine her heart is still racing. She's scared. She's humiliated. She's 100% guilty. And this is what Jesus says to her in verse 10. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. That doesn't mean be sinless. 
That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, repent and get out of this. Don't ever do this again. Get away from it. Get this. According to his standard, he who was without sin, the only one qualified to stone her, was left standing there. Jesus could have. He could have, he could have spoken and the judgment of God could have come down and she would have died instantly. But he didn't. You know why he didn't? Because not long after, he would be beaten and crucified for her adultery. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. This is what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. I know that you're familiar with, uh, with, these, with this text because it gets brought up a lot with a lot of rock throwing. But look at this text. Paul says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, and here's the list, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers. It's a long list. It's not just homosexuals here. Will inherit the kingdom of God. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's what you pay attention to in those verses. You see, because none of those that's listed, those sinful lifestyles, are unforgivable. None of them. They're all forgivable. And so by the Spirit of God, adultery can be forgiven. So if you're not married, prepare now to not place yourself in a position to even commit adultery. If you've broken this commandment, then repent. Repent of it and commit to God to never do it again. And if you've been hurt by adultery, then I would say to ask God to give you the strength to properly forgive the one who has hurt you. That's tough. But is there an area of your life sexually that you haven't completely surrendered to God? Either in thought or in deed. See, it's between you and Him. Please know that there are no rocks inside this building ready for stoning. Nobody has a rock with them. We have nothing to offer but redemption through Jesus Christ. But you've got to take that first step. Here's the thing. When you take that first step, you're not going to take it alone. Don't leave here with unresolved shame or regret. Understand the devastation. Understand the danger, the harm that comes from this. But there's forgiveness in the cross. Let me pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the power in your word. God, I've tried to speak truth and love. I know that this is a sensitive topic. But Father, I ask that as we begin this invitation right now, that you would stir hearts and minds. If there's couples that need to come down and recommit themselves to one another and pray at the altar over their family and their situation, their relationships, or whoever it needs to be, I pray, God, that they would have the boldness to step up and call on you. Now, we cannot be the same as the world. Help us to eradicate these statistics in the church and let it start today. God, let us change the game plan today. Don't let Satan destroy what you're trying to create through healthy marriage relationships. Father, help us to be obedient to you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Would you stand? Jesus, I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him.
Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me fill the Holy Spirit. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Thank you. 